Hey guys, welcome back to our mini series on the Book of Enoch. Now, if you're new to the series, as I've been saying throughout, if you're new to the series, please go back to the beginning and start from the beginning and work your way through because quite frankly, I'm already three quarters of the way through my arguments. What I'm trying to do in this series is give a comprehensive argument regarding the Book of Enoch because it's something that, quite frankly, I was never able to find when I was looking for it. So I want to just present this comprehensive look at the Book of Enoch in light of the New Testament. So if you are jumping in here and you're not starting at the beginning, which you need to go start at the beginning, but if you're not going to do that, just really quick 30 second summary. The Book of Enoch is an ancient Jewish book that was quoted by Jude. It was quoted by the apostles. They taught from it, they referenced it. Jude called it prophecy. Jesus taught from it and called it scripture. And in the first video, we looked at the history of the Book of Enoch, as well as what Jude and Jesus specifically said. In the videos after that, we looked at how heavily referenced it was all throughout the New Testament. The apostles were teaching from it. They were referencing it. It was something they drew heavily from. And we're kind of continuing that in this video. However, in this video, we're going to look specifically at what the book of Enoch has to say about Jesus himself, about the coming Messiah, the anointed one, the Christ. Now, if you watched my last video, which you should have, then you'll know that I said in this video, I'm going to talk about the thing that really clinched all this for me. Okay, I understand this is a big pill to swallow. To say that there is another book that should be part of scripture, big pill to swallow. Totally understand. And it wasn't something I even initially accepted. I saw that Jude quoted it. I even saw that Jude called it prophecy. At that time, I hadn't yet seen that Jesus also referenced it and called it scripture. I didn't recognize that yet. But I saw that it was heavily referenced throughout the New Testament. I saw Jude quoted it. He called it prophecy. I saw that it had all of these things going for it. And I was leaning in that direction. But the thing that really clinched it is what we're going to talk about first in this video. Because again, historically and archaeologically, this book was definitely written before Jesus. That's not argued. Nobody argues with that. It's undeniable. We have manuscripts that still exist today that were found that still exist today, which were those exact manuscripts were written before Jesus. So we know the book of Enoch was written before Jesus. And that's really, 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 really important because the book of Enoch says something about Jesus that pins him as the Messiah, or at least it pins it down to the exact time period that Jesus was in. The Messiah had to come right then. So what am I talking about? Well, if we look at the book of Enoch, just to give you a summary, which I've already given in the earlier videos, but the book of Enoch largely follows the story of these angels who are called watchers who came down to earth. They saw that women were very beautiful and they took these women for themselves as wives and had children with them who were the giants. This is all summed up in like three or four verses in the book of Genesis. And a lot of Christians read that story and they have no idea what it's talking about. And they make up all these ideas about what they think it could be talking about. And they never bother learning what the ancient people said it was. They just make up their own ideas, which we need to not do that. But the point is the book of Enoch is talking about that story in detail. These angels in heaven see these women are beautiful. They come down, they want them for themselves. They have children with them. Those children are the giants. It causes this time period of total destruction and horrible things happening because these giants are extremely evil. They are destroying the earth. They're destroying everything. They're actually eating humans. They're cannibals. They're eating humans for food because they've used up all the other resources. Total horrible time to live. And eventually 
The good angels in heaven who didn't fall, specifically the four living creatures that John describes, they go to God and they say, okay, God, you can see all the things that are happening on earth. You can see all the horrible, wicked things that are happening and all the destruction that is being caused by these children of these watchers that fell. But you haven't told us yet what to do. Please tell us what to do. What do you want us to do about this? And so God begins issuing them commands to go and bind them and put them into darkness and to do this and do that and do this other thing. All sorts of stuff. I already talked about this in earlier videos and just gave a brief summary. But my point is, jumping into that story in chapter 10, we read God's response to Michael telling him one of the things he wants him to do. He says, And the Lord said unto Michael, Go, bind Semhaza. Semhaza is one of those angels that fell. He's actually the leader of the angels that fell. Go, bind Semhaza and his associates who have united themselves with women so as to have defiled themselves with them in all their uncleanness. And when their sons have slain one another and they've seen the destruction of their beloved ones, bind them fast for 70 generations in the valleys of the earth until the day of their judgment and of their consummation, until the judgment that is forever and ever is consummated. In those days, they will be led off to the abyss of fire and to the torment and the prison in which they will be confined forever. And whosoever will be condemned and destroyed will from then on be bound together with them to the end of all generations. So this is a passage that I've seen a lot of people talk about online. If you're familiar with the book of Enoch, you've probably seen other videos about the book of Enoch because there are people out there who read this book. Some people call it scripture, some people don't. But the point is they talk about this passage a lot because it says that these fallen angels, these watchers, are going to be bound for 70 generations until their judgment is consummated. And what a lot of people think that means is that they're going to be bound for 70 generations until their judgment is over because the word consummated could mean it's it's completed it's over and so a lot of people say they're bound for 70 generations and then they're released and i've seen people talk about this it's actually it's an interesting idea because the thing that these watchers were doing when they came down is they were teaching mankind how to do things that mankind was never meant to do and when you read the descriptions about what they were teaching it kind of lines up with a lot of what we call science today and it kind of looks like they had maybe some advanced technology that we don't give credit to when we look back in history because we come from the secular worldview that teaches us that we came from cavemen and we evolved from monkeys. But if we reject that worldview and we look at, at scripture and also look at history, we can see that there is a ton of evidence for ancient technology. Okay, I know that's crazy and far out there, but quite frankly, there just is. There are things that they did that are still existing, like gigantic monolithic structures that we still, with all of our engines, all of our electricity, all of our power, we do not have the ability to construct that today. Stones that are too heavy for our strongest cranes to lift were lifted up on top of structures. And we don't have the technology to do it today. So how'd they do it? Now, that's a total rabbit hole. You can have fun going down it or not. But my point right now is these people are saying, look, these watchers were teaching these things back then. And it seems like there's evidence that there was advanced technology back then that they were giving them. And now here we are today. We live in another age of advanced technology. Could it be that these watchers have been released? And they start looking at, okay, well, it says they're going to be bound for 70 generations. And what is 70 generations? What's a generation? And they look at Psalms, which says that a person's life is about 70 years or maybe maybe 80. And so then they calculate, well, 70 times 70 is like 4,900 ish, somewhere around there. And they say, well, that does kind of add up. That would be sometime right around now. And, and these are all really interesting ideas. And I think there is definitely a connection between the modern world and the things that the watchers were teaching. Absolutely believe that there is a connection, but I don't think that those watchers are released now. And I don't think they were ever going to be released because when you read it, it says, they will be held until their judgment is consummated. Okay, well, they're, these people are taking the idea that consummated means their judgment is over. But that word consummated could also mean, you know, finalized, completed as in like the gavel comes down, it's sealed, it's done, there's no going back. Their judgment is consummated, it's finalized. 
And I think that's what Enoch is saying. And the reason I think that's what Enoch is saying is because we know exactly when those 70 generations were completed. And it's not the modern age. Now you might be saying, well, hold on. What do you mean you, we know? We, how do we know? Well, that's what we're going to look at. Because if that means their judgment was finalized at this point, then this is what we got to look for. We need to look 70 generations after Enoch, because he's the one living at the time that this judgment was put forth. At the time God said this is going to happen, Enoch was the guy alive. So we need to look 70 generations after Enoch, and we should be looking for some sort of judgment being consummated. Either their judgment's over and they're released, or their judgment is finalized and sealed and there's no going back. That's what we're looking for. And I think we can clearly see that 70 generations later, their judgment was finalized and sealed and there's no going back. And to see that, we're going to look at the book of Luke chapter 3. Now, I'm just going to put this up on the screen so you can see exactly what I'm saying. But I want you to remember as you look at this, the book of Enoch was definitively written before Jesus. Before Jesus. So look at how pinpoint accurate this thing is that the book of Enoch says. And I think there is no way you can argue against this, personally. Because the book of Enoch was definitively written before Jesus, and it pinpoints when the judgment of the watchers would be consummated. Let's look at it. Luke chapter 3, starting in verse 23. When Jesus began his ministry... He was about 30 years old. People thought that Jesus was Joseph's son. Joseph was the son of Heli. Heli was the son of Mattat. Mattat was the son of Levi. Levi was the son of Melchi. Melchi was the son of Jani. Jani was the son of Joseph. Joseph was the son of Matthias. Matthias was the son of Amos. Amos was the son of Nahum. Nahum was the son of Esli. Esli was the son of Nagai. Nagai was the son of Maath. Maath was the son of Matathias. Matathias was the son of Samin. Samin was the son of Josek. Josek was the son of Joda. Joda was the son of Joanan. Joanan was the son of Risa. Risa was the son of Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel was the son of Shealtiel. Shealtiel was the son of Neri. Neri was the son of Melchi. Melchi was the son of Adai. Adai was the son of Kozim. Kozim was the son of Elmadam. Elmadam was the son of Er. Er was the son of Joshua. Joshua was the son of Eleazar. Eleazar was the son of Joram. Joram was the son of Mattat. Mattat was the son of Levi. Levi was the son of Simeon. Simeon was the son of Judah. Judah was the son of Joseph. Joseph was the son of Jonam. Jonam was the son of Eliakim. Eliakim was the son of Malia. Malia was the son of Mena. Mena was the son of Matatha. Matatha was the son of Nathan. Nathan was the son of David. David was the son of Jesse. Jesse was the son of Obed. Obed was the son of Boaz. Boaz was the son of Salmon. Salmon was the son of Nation. Nation was the son of Aminadab. Aminadab was the son of Admin. Admin was the son of Arni. Arni was the son of Hezron. Hezron was the son of Perez. Perez was the son of Judah. Judah was the son of Jacob. Jacob was the son of Isaac. Isaac was the son of Abraham. Abraham was the son of Terah. Terah was the son of Nahor. Nahor was the son of Sarig. Sarig was the son of Reu. Reu was the son of Peleg. Peleg was the son of Eber. Eber was the son of Shelah. Shelah was the son of Canaan. Canaan was the son of Arphaxad. Arphaxad was the son of Shem. Shem was the son of Noah. Noah was the son of Lamech. Lamech was the son of Methuselah. Methuselah was the son of Enoch. Exactly 70 generations after Enoch, the judgment of the watchers was consummated. It was finalized. It was set in stone. The gavel came down and there was no going back. 70 generations later, exactly like the book of Enoch said. And remember, the book of Enoch was definitively written before Jesus. And it accurately pinpointed when that judgment would be consummated. Only true prophecy can do that. Only true scripture can do that. So no, I don't think that the 70 generations is the watchers getting released here in the time that we currently live in. No, the 70 generations were completed when their judgment was finalized and set in stone 2,000 years ago at the 70th generation when Jesus came. This is why Paul said 
that if the rulers of this world, the spiritual rulers and the powers and the principalities, if they had known what God was up to, they would never have crucified Jesus. They never would have done it because they sealed their own fate when they did that. I can only imagine that those principalities, those spiritual rulers were probably like, okay, we're coming up on the 70th generation. We got to keep our eyes out. And then what do you know? Oh man, God's own son is here in the flesh. This is crazy. We got to take him out of the picture. This is, this has got to be what he was talking about. We got to take him out. So they go after him and they kill him. But in doing so, they consummate their own judgment. They seal their own fate. The gavel comes down because God says, gotcha. This book said it would be exactly 70 generations after Enoch that the judgment would be consummated. And exactly 70 generations after Enoch, Jesus was born. Only scripture can prophesy the truth that accurately, that far in advance, that pinpointed accuracy can only be done if a book is given to us by God. So as far as I'm concerned, I could stop the video right here because between Jude quoting it and calling it prophecy, Jesus referencing it and calling it scripture and the fact that it pinpointed to the generation when Jesus would be born, when the Messiah would come, there really is no more reason to keep arguing as far as I'm concerned. But I do want to keep going through what the book of Enoch says about Jesus, because I think it's beneficial for us to understand where the apostles were getting this from. And again, this all adds credence to this argument, because if the apostles were teaching from this book, then there's reason to think this book was scripture. And if this book pinpointed exactly when Jesus was going to come, there's reason to think this book is scripture. If Jude calls it prophecy, there's reason to think that this book is scripture. So. All of this is meant to be a cumulative argument, but I would say between Jude, Jesus, and this prophecy all being there on this side, that is such a heavy argument that I, I don't think there really is much more needed, and yet there is a whole lot more there. So that's what we're going to keep going through. We're going to keep looking at what else does the book of Enoch say about Jesus and how the apostles were using that and referencing that throughout their writings. And also Jesus himself using that and referring to that. Now, for the most part, I'm going to just read through some of these passages because quite frankly, you guys know who Jesus is and you know what the New Testament says about him. So I'm not going to draw as many parallels here and point you to specific verses in the New Testament. I just want you to hear the things that the book of Enoch has to say about the Messiah and what he's going to do and who he's going to be. I will occasionally draw your attention to specific things and just point out like, hey, look, this is where the apostles got this thing from. I'll, I'll point that out occasionally. But for the most part, I'm just going to read you a few things from the book of Enoch about Jesus and I'm going to rely on you to have enough knowledge of the New Testament to draw the connection yourself. Okay? So I'm going to start off by jumping in at chapter 38. And this is really where Enoch first begins to introduce this character who is what he calls the elect one or the righteous one. At one point he calls him the anointed one, which is what the word Christ means. He's referring to Jesus. And this is where he first introduces this character. So I'm just going to start there. Chapter 38, verse 1, he says, The first parable, when the congregation of the righteous will appear, and sinners will be judged for their sins and will be driven from the face of the earth. And when the righteous one will appear before the eyes of the righteous, whose elect works hang upon the Lord of spirits, and light will appear to the righteous and the elect who dwell on the earth. Where then will be the dwelling of the sinners, and where the resting place of those who have denied the Lord of Spirits? It had been good for them if they had not been born. So Enoch first introduces this Messiah figure here, and it's interesting that he says this is going to happen when the congregation of the righteous will appear, because when you read the New Testament, the word that is typically translated as church is the Greek word ekklesia, and it doesn't mean church. That's a bad translation that's got a lot of history around why they picked that word. But the word means 
assembly or congregation. So Enoch is saying, when the congregation, or in our words, when the church of the righteous will appear and the sinners will be judged for their sins and will be driven from the face of the earth, and when the righteous one will appear before the eyes of the righteous. This is his introduction to this Messiah figure, this anointed one, the righteous one. He starts off by calling it the first parable because the book of Enoch is full of what are called parables. They're these visions that he saw and he's explaining, this is what's going to come. This is what's going to happen. And so he's saying the first parable, this is about the righteous one, when he's going to appear. So let's keep reading and see what does he have to say about this righteous one. In chapter 39, starting in verse 3, Enoch says, And in those days a whirlwind carried me off from the earth and set me down at the end of the heavens. And there I saw another vision, the dwelling places of the holy and the resting places of the righteous. Here mine eyes saw their dwellings with his righteous angels and their resting places with the holy. And they petitioned and interceded and prayed for the children of men, and righteousness flowed before them as water and mercy like dew upon the earth. So it is among them forever and ever. And in that place mine eyes saw the elect one of righteousness and of faith, and I saw his dwelling place under the wings of the Lord of Spirits. And righteousness will prevail in his days, and the righteous and elect will be without number before him forever and ever. And all the righteous and elect before him will be strong as fiery lights, and their mouth will be full of blessing, and their lips extol the name of the Lord of Spirits, and righteousness before him will never fail, and uprightness will never fail before him. There I wished to dwell, and my spirit longed for that dwelling place. If we jump over to chapter 40, we can now see something that I already referenced in an earlier video where Enoch saw the four living creatures that John described in the book of Revelation. John described them as praising God and praising the lamb who was slain. Well, again, I just want to read again what the book of Enoch says. He says, and after that, I saw thousands of thousands and 10,000 times 10,000. I saw a multitude beyond number and reckoning who stood before the Lord of Spirits. And on the four sides of the Lord of Spirits, I saw four presences different from those that sleep not. And I learned their names for the angel that went with me made known to me their names and showed me all the hidden things. And I heard the voices of those four presences as they uttered praises before the Lord of glory. The first voice blesses the Lord of Spirits forever and ever. And the second voice I heard blessing the elect one and the elect ones who hang upon the Lord of Spirits. And the third voice I heard pray and intercede for those who dwell on the earth and supplicate in the name of the Lord of Spirits. And I heard the fourth voice fending off the devils and forbidding them to come before the Lord of Spirits to accuse them who dwell on the earth. So we already looked at this in an earlier video, but here we see those four living creatures praising God and also praising the elect one, or as John said, the lamb who was slain. So now let's jump over to chapter 45. This is where we really start getting into the meat. He really starts ramping it up, talking about this elect one, the chosen one, the anointed one. In chapter 45, he says, And this is the second parable concerning those who deny the name of the dwelling of the holy ones and the Lord of spirits. And into the heaven they will not ascend, and on the earth they will not come. Such will be the lot of the sinners who have denied the name of the Lord of Spirits, who are therefore preserved for the day of suffering and tribulation. On that day, mine elect one will sit on the throne of glory and will try their works, and their places of rest will be innumerable. And their souls will grow strong within them when they see mine elect ones and those who have called upon my glorious name. Then will I cause mine elect one to dwell among them. And I will transform the heaven and make it an eternal blessing and light. And I will transform the earth and make it a blessing. And I will cause mine elect ones to dwell upon it. But the sinners and evildoers will not set foot thereon. For I have provided and satisfied with peace my righteous ones, and have caused them to dwell before me. But for the sinners, 
there is judgment impending with me, so that I will destroy them from the face of the earth. So we see there, the elect one will sit on a throne of glory and will judge the earth. Let's continue into chapter 46. And there I saw one who had a head of days, and his head was white like wool, and with him was another being whose countenance had the appearance of a man, and his face was full of graciousness like one of the holy angels. And I asked the angel who went with me and showed me all the hidden things concerning that son of man, who he was and from where he was, and why he went with the head of days. And he answered and said unto me, This is the Son of Man who has righteousness, with whom dwells righteousness, and who reveals all the treasures of that which is hidden, because the Lord of Spirits has chosen him, and whose lot has the preeminence before the Lord of Spirits in uprightness forever. And this Son of Man whom you have seen will raise up the kings and the mighty from their seats and the strong from their thrones and will loosen the reins of the strong and break the teeth of the sinners. And he will put down the kings from their thrones and kingdoms because they do not extol and praise him nor humbly acknowledge from where the kingdom was bestowed upon them. So in this passage, Enoch describes this elect one as the Son of Man. Now, if you are at all familiar with your New Testament, you should know that Jesus repeatedly referred to himself as the Son of Man. Now, most of the time, Christian teachers will tell us this is a reference back to the book of Daniel, where the book of Daniel described the Messiah and called him a Son of Man. Now, Yes, it's probably a reference to the book of Daniel, but there's no reason to say it wasn't a reference to the book of Enoch either, because we can see that they were heavily referencing the book of Enoch throughout all the things that they were saying, all the things they were teaching. And quite frankly, the book of Enoch called him the son of man a lot more than Daniel did. Now that phrase son of man simply means human. Okay, let's not get too caught up on the phrase. It was just a way that they said he's a human. But that exact phrase, son of man, is a description of the Messiah that Enoch gives over and over and over and over. Daniel gives it once, I think. And Jesus uses it of himself over and over and over and over. So I think it's an interesting description. But let's, aside from the phrase son of man, let's just look at what it says about the son of man. The book of Enoch, describing this anointed one, this chosen one, this elect one, says that this is the Son of Man who reveals all the treasures of that which is hidden because the Lord of Spirits has chosen him. Well, Paul wrote to the Colossians saying, I want you to know how hard I work for you, those in Laodicea, and others who have never seen me. I want their hearts to be strengthened and joined together with love so that they may be rich in their understanding. This leads to their knowing fully God's secret, that is, Christ himself. In him, all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge are hidden. So Paul says, all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge are hidden in Christ, and I want you to know Christ so that you can have those treasures, so that you can know fully God's secret. If you know Christ, you know all God's secrets. This is also something he talks about in 1 Corinthians 2. We have the Spirit of God who searches the thoughts of God. You can't know somebody else's thoughts unless you have that person's spirit, but we have God's spirit, therefore we can know God's thoughts. This is something Paul taught repeatedly, but he specifically says, in Christ all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge are hidden. And Enoch said that the Son of Man is the one who reveals all the treasures of that which is hidden because of the Lord of Spirits who has chosen him. So, bearing in mind the fact that the book of Enoch was definitively written long before what Paul said, look at the fact that the book of Enoch says these treasures are hidden in the anointed one, the elect one, that son of man that Enoch is talking about. Those things, those treasures are hidden in him. And then Paul comes along and he also says the treasures of wisdom and knowledge and, and these things, these secret things of God, these things are hidden in Christ, in Jesus. 
The book of Enoch was written first, and so it would seem that Paul is drawing from the book of Enoch to explain what he is teaching about Jesus, about the Messiah. And so if Paul is teaching from the book of Enoch and teaching us theology about who the Messiah is, who Jesus is, and he's referencing the book of Enoch, then shouldn't the book of Enoch be something that we ourselves are learning from and reading and learning about the Messiah from that book? I think that's something we should consider. So I'm going to cut this video short here just to keep it from getting out of control. And I also want to have the time to focus on the next passage that I'm going to look at because the next one is something that is just so incredible where Enoch is saying something that is exactly what the apostles taught about Jesus and what Jesus said about himself. And it's so important. I don't want to rush that one. So I'm going to cut this one short here and I'm going to just jump into the next video. So please join me in our next video in this series as we continue looking at what the book of Enoch has to say about Jesus and how it is clear the apostles were teaching the exact same thing. So thanks for watching this video. Please join me in our next video.